I want my words to cloak you like shimmering oil paint on a canvas. I want the refined details to nibble at your brain, tiny specks of colors peeping out from a collage of radiant spreads. I want you to dissect the different layers, wipe away the colors and the light to get down to the bare skeleton, the mere sketch. Mr. Mercado once said that he respected artists for taking a blank canvas and turning it into a masterpiece. A simple white stretch of cotton, completely empty until kissed by the ideas of its owner. But much like the blank slate of a classroom chalkboard, no one will ever learn what it can become unless someone's ideas are spread across it. On August 27th, I came in with a blank canvas. Sure, it had a dirty wooden frame, the foundation of an identity, but that was the part that no one saw. The real front was the rectangle of possibilities, slightly scuffed with a sweat of apprehension beating down and dirt from packed shoulders in a hallway. It seemed that, in accordance to existentialist beliefs, its existence preceded its essence. But, lo and behold, jagged sketch marks began to appear on the surface of the canvas. Our first assignment, portfolio reflection, had my hand shaking, the metaphorical eraser streaking out shaving of perfectionist paranoia. I printed out five copies, each with a different header, folded area, title, and reflection. Portfolio, loose instructions, freedom, tight parameters of rubrics, of plans, of scheduled study guides that stitched the canvas to the back did not want to pucker, but this was new terrain, new landscape. Whenever an artist begins a landscape, she's supposed to draw a horizon line. This gives the whole scene a starting point, but most clearly, it's where the sun sets, a new one rises, where the end of an arduous road fades out of view. I knew where to draw the horizon line, but even the darkest of pencils could not bring the end of the year clearly into view. Instead, I did the next thing that every painting requires, a midline. Two semesters split into two quarters. I could do this, but my sketch was only beginning. There was grammar, there was vocab, and above all, there was writing. Suddenly, I had the world at my fingertips. I got lost, daydreaming in every car ride, wonderstruck by words. Rough, approximate shapes, the beginnings of extra essays, spiraled out of my fingertips as I opened my mind to the possibilities. I could create anything, and not even my eyes were my boundaries. I pecked away at essays, laughing to myself as I wrote a suspenseful second-person piece about peeps. The edges of their bodies elegantly curved to make two circles and two ovals at the top, the shape of a bunny's head. They wait patiently in three rows, whispering for you to come near them like a siren learned sailors. Perhaps not the deepest, but I was eager to take risks. I had never written in second person, so I figured I'd try it out. After all, growth comes from discomfort. And then came the narrative. By nature, the still life of fruit to the writing world. Done before, cliched topics, major. Admittedly, when searching for rewrite material, many of my past narratives had consisted of when I broke my pinky, when I broke my wrist, or even the when my brother broke his leg. But this narrative has had to be different, simple, hidden. The vaguest instructions I would yet received, but the challenge beneath them was impossible to deny. I wrote, I rewrote, I scratched, I wordsmith. One of the best artists I know once smiled as she saw me tweaking my sketch time after time only to adjust the framework ever so slightly. That is what art is, but you can't spend more time sketching than painting. I poured my heart into that piece, and to quote Paul Cezanne, a work of art which did not begin in emotion is not art. My thoughts were becoming more introspective, and I was ready to add perspective to my pieces, different vantage points that revealed how I was looking at things, what happened when I strayed from center focus. At this point, to quote my narrative, September had blown away with luminescent fallen leaves. And then, another challenge. Make it rich, make it meaningful. I walked through a gallery of other people's words and peer reviews, waltzing back to my own designated framework. My writing was fun, pleasant, argumentative when it needed to be. But some pieces were as substantial as painting of sticks. Everything was positioned correctly, it was clever in its intent, but the grass growing in between needed deeper roots. Eleven essays handed in that quarter, and I slackened my choking grip on my pencil. I needed to smudge some of the sketch line, cut down on the words I used, yet increase the meaning, paint as impressionistically as possible. Painting in the studio, I'd grown into a somewhat tight painter, clinging to the most ornate details for months on end. 
In one of my essays from the second quarter, I wrote, Mystic crystals laced the surface of my lips, almost as cold as the words forming inside of them. Betrayal is the worst kind of ache, isn't it? I said quietly, my breath dissipating into a fragile cloud. While I'm showing my work to my brother, he simply said, there's a way to say things with far fewer words. And he was right. I was finally opening up to the beauty of simplicity, the realization that I couldn't fall in love with what I was trying to say at the expense of how I said it. As we delved into the world of short stories, I found myself entranced in the small number of strokes that painted a big story. The lottery, the stone boy, thank you ma'am, and who could forget the A and P, defining fantasy in a new light. Fantasies were unrealistic, desire bound to impossibility. Forget fantasy though, I had goals. I threw myself into analysis, and it became a game. How many black print pricks of meaning could you get from a single letter? Authors seemed to whisper, and I recalled my earlier work. You should pine through my words like the speckled leaves and the smattering of delicate foliage that surrounds you, turning each one on its side to examine it from every angle. My eyes watched out for symbolism around every corner. Red for courage, yellow for cowardice, green for innocence. The world of storytelling was not black and white, and I needed to be like the film critic whom Steven Spielberg described as having had more colors in the language he used than most artists have in their palettes. And, like analogous colors, I connected things. In my analysis of Dead Poet Society, I compared an untranslatable Swedish noun, Nangata, that connoted the moon's reflection across water to the wonder that romanticism brought to the boys of Welton Academy. I wrote, it is a poem, it is a painting, it is 1,000 sparkling memories that cannot be contained into a mere definition. Those who did not see the wonder, the realists, found a trap mangata in a glass jar to examine it. I planned it out, I thought it out, and it paid off. Beneath the words, the carpe diem attitude tickled the back of my mind. Risks were more rewarding than regrets. And then, poetry. From the first day of the poetry unit, the unexpected task popped up. 10 minutes, 10 lines. I wrote, scrolls of winds, unwritten desire, unraveling whispers in the frigid fire. Light breaks through, the clouds anew, the drifts all cast in a bluish hue. Halfway through, I was stopped and asked what I was thinking about. I replied, things I've painted, because after all, poets are artists. But sometimes, artists are poets. This was made even more apparent when the work we did with ekphrastic poetry transforming views into verse. Looking at the hotel room, I jotted, yellowed, smoky parchment, so flimsy in the wind, heavy in her fingertips, folded, creased, and thinned. Poetry was like oil paints themselves, tiny tubes with more concentrated color in a single dab than a whole platter of runny acrylic paint, rose. I raked through my hair like a frenzied Van Gogh at times, calling over words for a sonnet for hours on end. They appeared singularly, small gems mined from the dirty slabs of brain blocks surrounding them. But there were times when the cadence was as polished as old silver, as scattered as starry night. For the most part, I couldn't be dissuaded from rhyming, but I started to glimpse at other techniques too. Different brush strokes, the same brush and the same paint, but a different application to the canvas. And then, the poetry slam. Draft after draft after draft memorizing three pages of poetry, performing it to the blank walls of the piano room, falling asleep to the echoes in my own voice, reciting words that exposed my worst weakness, common sense, the fear of lacking experience to make a judgment. But besides the kind of since feeling his first experience, I needed to build upon a different kind, a more practical one, research. Midnight MLA panics, outlines, drafts, more drafts, but from the rubble of rigid paraphrasing came confidence, knowledge. I could add depth to my work from the pieces of my past, from historical fiction to fantasy to research. But depth always means lights and darks. And for part of third quarter, there were times when I was trapped in darkness. Brain blocks taunted me, the mock college essays seemed to mock me, that I needed to know what could trigger release. How, where, when could I write blessed? Then, I saw the light. I set up my own studio in my basement, Want to match the ideas in my head. The words came, and a smile crept across my face. I wrote, a simple lamp illuminated my paper in a dim haze. Not so bright that it blinded me, but not dark enough for my ideas to be enveloped in shadows. 
but no one could block up the towering Caesar shadows, least of all Cassius. Shakespeare seemed to have Picasso's blood at first, his sayings abstract and cryptic, but I just didn't, almost blind to the complexity after reading Comedy of Errors afterwards. In fact, returning to normal prose was like eating fruit after cake. You simply can't compare the sweetness. And compared to previous quarters, the weather outside the fourth was bleak. Flowers blossomed into beauty, but existentialism brought even the smallest things into question. A quote from a philosophy book on that shelf says it all. When we start to think philosophically, we begin to think without a safety net. The firm ground that we thought lay beneath our feet can quickly dissolve away, leaving us hanging over a void. I filled that void with somewhat cynical thoughts of how society was regressing. The downfall of humans was not to be mingled with personal progression. Now that the year is almost finished, my canvas has been filled with wonders beyond what I could have ever foreseen. My identity shines on the surface that was once untouched by the magic and colors I couldn't see. While I can reflect in the rearview mirror of my past, the challenges on the road ahead will only continue to shape me. That's the true beauty of oil paint. It doesn't dry, so the painting is never done. And as for my thoughts, grind them off in a plastic cup of turpentine and leave them on a raggedy cloth if you so please. If you do though, I would only hope that the bristles of your brush are forever stained with the tints and shades of my words. <laughs>